You know, one of the most volatile subjects in the church deals with marriage. Uh, not so much marriage, everybody agrees on marriage, it's a good thing, you know, but marriage and divorce and remarriage. And of course, a lot of opinions about that. Uh, one of the things that we might be able to say about that is it's nothing new. This subject has been a volatile subject from the very beginning. Now the reason for this is because most of us experience marriage and many in the church have been affected by divorce, either directly, it's happened to them in their own lives, or perhaps indirectly through their family, through their friends, they've had a brother, a sister, a child, something that has gone through a divorce. So we've all been affected one way or another and everyone you know, has an opinion, has a question about it. So this morning I'd like to review some principles and teachings about marriage and divorce found not only throughout the Bible but especially in Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 7. I think you couldn't do a series of lessons on 1 Corinthians and not deal with 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, so that's uh, going to be my attempt this morning. Now there may be some things you agree with and there may be some things you don't agree with here and that's okay simply because a lot of people have different, different opinions. So I offer these points as a summary of my own study over the years, study that I am continually adding to. Now there are several models of teaching throughout the Bible concerning marriage and I'd like to go through these just as a basic, something based to, from which we will review the comments that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 7. First of all, there's the, what we call the base model. It's interesting to note that marriage is the first social unit established by God. And so we have to go back to Genesis. So you can keep your finger in 1 Corinthians there, but we'll go back there. So let's go to Genesis chapter two and look at the base model because all of the information about marriage, as far as the Bible is concerned, is in Genesis chapter, well I won't say all, but certainly about the base model is in chapter two, beginning in verse 22. So it says, And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So let's take a look at some of the elements just from this passage of the base model of marriage given in the Bible. Element number one, man and woman are the same in nature, both created by God and expressly made for one another. You know, some people are always wondering, you know, they're challenging that idea today. You know, we have two men and two, or two women, but the Bible, the base model, is based on the idea of creation. What did God create? He created a man, He created a woman, both have the same human nature, and they were created for expressly for one another. It wasn't like a, an accident that they found each other. Element number two. The marriage unit consists of only one man and only one woman. This is the model blessed by God, as I said. Not two men or two women or three women and one man. The old, uh, the old story, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Element number three, thank you. Element number three. The union of a man and his wife supersedes the union of these people with their parents. Always a difficult one. I preached a sermon a little while back talking about how to guarantee a divorce. And the number one thing I said on how to guarantee a divorce was make sure you don't break away from your parents. Make sure you make your daddy you know, higher than your husband. You're on your way if you do that or vice versa. So the union of a man and his wife supersedes the union 
of these people with their parents. When men and women marry, their new relationship takes priority over their relationship with their parents. It doesn't eliminate that relationship, of course not. It's a beautiful thing, extended family. However, it does take priority. More problems in marriage because either parents or children don't recognize this very basic element. And I would say to parents, you need to encourage your children to do this thing. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? But we need to do that. Element number four, the marriage union is exclusive, one flesh, and cannot be entered into by any other individual in any way, one flesh. And I believe that also includes artificial insemination by a third party for a childless couple. Again, I said some people don't agree, that's, that's fine. You know, this, this problem of genetics, uh, artificial insemination, so on and so forth, people say, how do we decide that? How, where is the moral center of that? The moral center is back in Genesis, chapter two, one flesh. You can't bring a third party in any way into that one flesh union. And some people say, oh, but look, the baby, they couldn't have the baby, so they brought a third party, uh, the semen from a third person or an egg from a third person. And the moral um, journey to okay that idea is simply that the end justifies the means. But as Christians, we've never believed in the end justifying the means. We believe that God's word is our guide. God said, one flesh, one flesh. And of course, we're also talking, this also includes you know, adultery, fornication, pornography, all those other things. Those are things you're bringing into that one flesh that have no business to being there. And then the fifth principle, uh, uh, yes, the fifth principle, um, within marriage, human sexuality can be expressed freely and completely without shame, without guilt, without embarrassment, within marriage. So in this passage, no exceptions or punishments or prohibitions were actually added in this passage because, well, there was no sin. It's all stated in positive terms. Do this, do that, do this, do that. There's no don't do this and, or else you'll be punished, simply because there's, there was no need at that time, there was no sin. The marriage model in Genesis is stated in completely positive terms because man was still perfect and without sin. So that's the, the base model. So then we move on to the uh, mosaic model. Once sin enters the world, mankind is weakened to the point where everything is affected, including marriage. For example, where mutual respect and honor were once assumed, there is now violence and disrespect, even slavery where men using their stronger physical nature are taking advantage of women because of their weaker physical nature, and women, because of their more complex nature, are trying to usurp their husbands using that particular tool. So the model starts to break down. Where formerly there would be natural development of new families from existing families, there is jealousy, there is possessiveness. Where fidelity and sexual exclusiveness is the norm, impurity and adultery become widespread. Where lifelong relationships are assumed, now we have broken marriages and abandonment that take place. So you, know, you start with the perfect base model, but once sin enters the world, that base model is attacked by all these different things and more. So in response to this, God, through Moses, allows certain laws to be put into place in order to mitigate or to keep at a minimum the damage in marriage caused by sinfulness. So I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. So we have the base model, it's a perfect model, sin enters the world, God now needs to mitigate the effects of sin on marriage. So we have 
a law that comes out, Deuteronomy chapter 24, let's read that. It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, and if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. And so in Deuteronomy 24, one such law permitted a husband to legally divorce his wife if she was sexually unfaithful, and we'll talk about that in a second. Now in this passage, Moses also protects the women from being unjustly passed around from man to man by forbidding the original husband from remarrying her. You know, the law said you couldn't remarry your, your ex-wife if she was married to someone else in the interim. So this law here, with the goal of minimizing the effects of sexual sin and the effects of the deterioration of marriage, uh, establishes sexual sin as a valid reason to divorce, something not mentioned in Genesis because this sin did not exist then. Some people say, yeah, well how come in Genesis, it, you know, well because there was no sin in Genesis, no need to add this, this law. God adds this through Moses at a later date. I want you to notice the development of teaching to address a new problem and a new circumstance. All right, so now we move on and look at the gospel model. It's interesting to note that many people think Jesus added the exception of adultery or fornication to the teaching on marriage and divorce. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 19, shall we? It's a familiar passage that people always go to when they're talking about marriage, divorce. And some people call it the exception clause. Matthew 19.9 says, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. We call that, see, Jesus added that. But Jesus added nothing new to what had already been written in the law. He merely clarified the interpretation that some scribes were giving to Deuteronomy chapter 24. That's exactly what he's doing here. He's not adding something new that nobody had heard of before. The problem was at the time the scribes were debating Deuteronomy 24. Some were saying that you could divorce your wife for any reason so long as you did the paperwork. So long as you signed a bill of divorce and put it in her hand. You know, as long as you went through the motions. So long as you did the paperwork you could divorce her for any reason. And others said no, the law said you could only justify divorce when there was sexual immorality. And so they come to Jesus. They've been going back and forth on this issue all the time. So they come to Jesus and they lay it in His lap. They want to know, what does it say? So Jesus responded to the argument by reminding them of the base model, that God still held them to the original model as their basis for marriage and that according to the law, only sexual immorality was a just cause for divorce. So he's not adding anything new, he's just saying this is the correct interpretation of this law. Now there are a lot of other issues regarding marriage, but this is the only one that Jesus addressed during His ministry. He didn't talk about other things, He just talked about and responded to the questions that the Pharisee asked Him, and their questions were based on Deuteronomy 24. Later on, in the epistles, Paul will discuss this subject a little further. So let's go on to the apostolic model. There are a lot of things that the gospel writers did not record in the gospels that were later written about in the epistles. 
Otherwise, why would we need the epistles? We'd only need the gospels. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter is saying, you know, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, if you read the Gospels, you don't understand quite that when you are baptized, you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, no. Peter articulates that idea in the book of Acts. Uh, the various gifts in 1 Corinthians, that Christians had in the first century, the ability to heal, the ability to speak in tongues, and so on and so forth. Those gifts and the use of those gifts are elaborated where? Well, they're elaborated in the epistles. You see what I'm saying? Jesus mentions it briefly in Mark, but Paul is the one that explains to the Corinthians how they're to use and how they're not to use these special gifts. Another one, the organization of the church. Nothing in the Gospels about the organization of the church. If we only had the Gospels, we wouldn't know about the plurality of elders, the role of women in the church, so on, deacons, things like that. All of that is, it's all in the epistles. So many new ideas that do not contradict, of course, and do not confuse established ones that are not found in the Gospels are discussed in the letters of the apostles and this is in accordance with what Jesus had told his apostles uh, that would eventually happen. Go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 in verses uh, 12 to 15. Let's read that idea or these words of Jesus together. He says, I have many more things to say to you. Oh, right there. I have many more things to say. I haven't told you everything, he says. But you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall take of Mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine, therefore I said, that he takes of mine and I will disclose it to you. So Jesus is basically saying to the apostles, I haven't told you everything you need to know about you know, the gospel and, 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 and the church. And, uh, you, know, you don't know everything. You can't take it all in now. But after, he says, after when? Well, after I send you the Spirit. Well, after He sends the Spirit is when? Well, he, he, has to, he has to resurrect from the dead and ascend to heaven before He sends the Spirit. That means after I'm gone, I will send you the Spirit. And the Spirit, He will give you more teaching, if you wish, more details, more clarification about what you need to know and what you need to teach. So Jesus would continue to reveal His will and purpose to the apostles concerning their work and the church through the Holy Spirit. So I say this because in 1 Corinthians 7 there's information about marriage which is not contained in the Gospels but helps us deal with the problems encountered by people in this area of life in situations that were not addressed by Jesus but were very common to people in the church at the time and even to this day. Now this teaching Paul obviously received from the Holy Spirit in order to respond to the questions that Christians had at the time. In other words, Christians had questions that they couldn't find answers to and so they asked Paul and Paul being an inspired apostle gives them the inspired answer. So let's, uh, you know, we don't have time to do verse by verse analysis although we'll be reading much of it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. Okay, now we're ready to go to 1 Corinthians 7. Need a little, you know, a little uh, introduction there. So Paul makes several main points about marriage in, verse, uh, in chapter 7. And undoubtedly they are a response to questions that people had about that subject that he is answering. So the first thing that he says is celibacy and marriage are both blessed by God. He says that in chapter 7 verse 1. Let's read together. He says now, uh, let's see, okay we can go to the scripture. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, 
It is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So, what's going on here? You have to kind of guess, well, what was the question? Well, it seems that some there in Corinth thought that being celibate was a higher calling than being married. But they were feeling bad because they just couldn't manage it. It sounds like a good idea, but then human nature steps in. It's not so easy. There may have even been some who were married who were trying to abstain in order to please the Lord. So Paul tells them that human nature being what it is, most people need to be married. And when they are, they should give themselves fully to one another in sexual union. And his caveat or his instruction is only abstain from sexual union by mutual consent. Don't use sex as a, as a weapon. Don't use it as a bargaining chip. It's mutual. It's interesting. He says the, the, the man has authority over the woman's body, but the woman has authority over the man's body. That, that's, that's a great responsibility. And he says, if you're going to separate because you need a timeout, you need to think about things, maybe there's some friction in the relationship, whatever, he says, that's fine, step away, step back from each other, but only for a short time, he said, because he recognizes what human nature is like. Don't do that for too long, you're putting yourself into a, a precarious situation. And then come back together again. And then he talks about celibacy briefly, he says, it has its advantages, but it's only for those who have been given the ability to live this way by God. So marriage is God's gift to man to deal with and to find satisfaction for normal human sexual desire without sinning. That's why he says because of immorality. If you're not married and you're a normal, healthy human being, you're going to have sexual desire. And if you're not married, the only way that you will satisfy that is perhaps in an immoral way. So he says because of that, because that's the way that God made us, our natural disposition, our natural situation is to be married. And those of you who would like to be celibate and like to please the Lord but can't manage it, you know, burning, sexual desire is eating you up, no, marry, he says, because that's good too. God blesses both. One is not a higher calling than the other. Second thing he says, he says, keep the lock in wedlock, basically. So in the next section, Paul addresses two groups, that's very important, concerning marriage breakups. So let's read chapter seven, verses 10 and 11 this time. He says, but to the married, okay, he's talking to those who are married, and he's talking to Christians, obviously. He says, but to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not send his wife away. Why does he say, the Lord, not I? Because he said, Jesus already talked about this. He's talking to Christians. He says, you, you already know this. A Christian married to each other should remain that way. Now this was a necessary teaching because among the Greeks and the Romans there were many classifications of marriage and in the Corinthian church there were many Greeks and Romans that had been converted. For example, slave marriages were considered non-binding in that society. In other words, they weren't legal and couples could be split up and sold separately if the master so desired. Imagine that. 
Also, marriages between a slave and a freed person were also seen as loose associations and they were easily dissolved. So Paul is saying that as Christians, regardless of their positions in life, if they were married, it was binding before God. He also specifies that if they are separated, they have two choices. He says to live like unmarried, meaning not to engage in any sexual union with someone else, as what would be expected of a Christian single person. You know, he's assuming a Christian single person is pure, does not you know, have sexual relations with people. So he's saying, if you separate for a time, then you ought to be like an unmarried person. You're not engaging in any type of sexual activity. That's one choice. Yeah, if you separate, there's friction, so on and so forth, then you're living like an unmarried person. Your other option is to return to the marriage. These two options did not involve sin, which Paul is trying to explain here. What can we do in different situations in order to avoid sin? That's the question. So this is completely in line with what Jesus was teaching. Paul says that married Christians should not divorce for any reason they wish. Now, he doesn't mention the exception of fornication, but it's assumed that they already know about Jesus' teaching on this. They want clarification about their situation. Okay, now he talks to another group, Christians who are married to non-believers. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, beginning verse 12. He says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord. Now remember, he's saying, not the Lord, not that what he's saying doesn't count. He's saying, Jesus didn't teach on this. This is the part, this is the new part. He says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, let him not send her away. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, let her not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. So now he talks to Christians married to non-believers and he says two things to them. One, if the non-believer is willing to live with the believer in peace, despite their faith differences, then they should remain married. Now again, what was going on there in Corinth that made them think otherwise? Well, there may have been some who thought that as Christians, they may have been obliged to cut off their relationships with non-believing or pagan spouses as did the Jews who divorced their foreign pagan wives at God's command in Ezra. You know, in Ezra chapter 10, God says to the Jews who had married foreign wives, priests and, and other people in the nation, they had married foreign wives, that they had, they had broken God's command. God had told them they weren't allowed to marry outside of their uh, nation. And He commands them to get a divorce. I'm not saying that's exactly the reason, but it could have been some Christian sensitive conscience. They had access to the Old Testament. They read Ezra, all of a sudden they're thinking, well, I'm married to somebody who's a pagan. What do I do? Is my marriage valid? Is it a good thing? But Paul sees this as a different case, not subject to laws that govern the Jews and could, you know, who couldn't marry outside their tribe in the Old Testament. Jewish Christians may have had some sensitivity to this idea, but not Gentiles to whom much of this teaching is directed. He even says that such unions are sanctified, which means they're blessed or they're legitimate because of the presence of the Christian in the marriage. Now the second thing he says to those in a mixed religious marriage, because that's where the question comes from, he says, if the non-believer leaves, let him go. Let her go. And it seems by his answer that some believe that if they remained loyal to the relationship, somehow they might save their partner in a vicarious way. Like I'm faithful, I'm faithful to God, you know, and if I, they abandon me but I hang on to this, there somehow I'm going to save them. But Paul tells them that they have no control over this once they've been abandoned, so they should just let go and live in peace. Very interesting here, the word, Paul that, the word that Paul uses, he says, not under bondage, in verse 15, is a word that describes slavery. 
The idea is that in the event of an abandonment, the Christian is no longer enslaved, bound, tied to the other individual or to the marriage. Now in this entire, here's, here's where it gets a little tricky. Some people say, oh, that doesn't mean the marriage, it just means you know, they don't have to serve their husband, they don't have to submit to their husband. You know. And my answer to that is, in this entire passage, Paul has been talking about marriage and divorce. The whole passage is about when to marry, when to divorce, you know, it's all about that. And so his meaning here in context and his word is very clear. If abandoned, the Christian is freed from that relationship without committing a sin, because that's what the point is. When do we sin and when do we not sin? Now just in case there are some who think that, you know, wow, this is a new teaching, this is a new interpretation of 1 Corinthians 7, mazalongo has gone nuts here. <laughs> I want to remind you what Alexander Campbell, how many people know, who know who, who Alexander Campbell is? Alexander Campbell, who was an early leader of the Restoration Movement and a great Bible scholar, I want you to see what he wrote. He said, it seems to me that in all cases of voluntary desertion on the side of the unbelieving party, the marriage covenant is made void and the believing party is to the deserter as though they had never been married. And he wrote that in the Millennial Harbinger, an early restorationist, an early Church of Christ, if you wish, newspaper. Very interesting that the Restoration Fathers, what they taught on 1 Corinthians 7, it seemed pretty clear to them. Other early Restorationists like Walter Scott and writers such as R. L. Whiteside also held to this view. And I mentioned them simply because they were the founders of the Restoration Movement. They were the early writers. They were brilliant Bible scholars. So let's remember that the base model is always the one that we work with. We always work with the base model. But through Moses and Jesus and Paul, God responds to and deals with the outcomes of marriages that have been attacked by sexual sins or human weakness and desertion. I acknowledge that there are you know, different points of view on these issues, but this is the conclusion that I've come to on what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 7. You know, uh, if, you, if you're a Christian and you're married and you're having problems, stay together. That's your option. And if you're a believer and, you're un, and, and your unbelieving partner abandons you, you're not bound. Somehow, I, I don't know how you can twist that to mean something, something else. Okay, so we don't forget the original point here. Paul points out three important things concerning the questions that the Corinthians are asking about marriage. Number one, both marriage and celibacy are blessed. One is not higher than the other, they're both blessed. Number two, the base model is always to stay married. But if your unbelieving spouse leaves you, let him go, you're not bound. Number three, he says marriage is normal, but being single and dedicated to the Lord has many, many advantages. We don't have time to read this, it's 20, 15 verses long, let me just summarize. In those times there was a great persecution of Christians and so to marry meant the possible risk to home and family from attack. So Paul prepares those who marry to be ready for the suffering that they may have to endure as married people. I mean, there's always challenges being married, let's face it. Raising children, teenagers, finances, you know, illness. Someone said to me the other day, <clears throat> well, they were talking about somebody else getting married. You know, they, were, they were a young married person. They were talking about another young married person or young person thinking about getting married. And they said, you know, he doesn't know what he's getting himself into. <laughs> and I said to this person, do you know what you got yourself into? Because you think you know the person that you're marrying. You're hoping, you know, I remember saying to my wife, I sure hope you are the person I think you are. I sure hope you're the person I think you are, because I want to marry the person I think you are. And thankfully, she's always been the person I thought she was. But you know, stuff happens in life, right? 
people are ill. You know, young people always think, you know, I start my life and it's good like this and it just starts getting better and better and just gets better and then I get married and it gets better and better and better. And better. Well, that's not how life works. We know that. You start here and it goes here and it goes down and up and down and up. You know, that's how life works, up and down. And marriage is hanging on, hanging, on to, hanging on to each other in the ups and the downs, right? So Paul prepares those who marry to be ready for the suffering they may have to endure because in the first century, aside from the normal ups and downs of marriage, Christians were being actively persecuted in that society. So he reminds those who are able to remain single that a life wholly dedicated to God, well, you know what? That can be a good life too. It has a lot of joys and blessings. Less worries about worldly things, no burden for family, greater freedom to serve and to know the Lord, freedom to go and do things on behalf of the kingdom. You, know, you want to be a missionary, whatever. You, if you're single, you can just go. If you're married, whoa, you got to sell the house, got to find a new School for the kids, you know, it's, it's a little trickier. I, I, I know what that's like. 26 moves, 26 moves. 33 years of marriage, 26 moves. That's, that's mission life, missionary life. Some people say, how do we know you're going to stay in Oklahoma? I just say, 26 moves. <laughs> I've had it, <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> so it depends on the, the place that God has put you, but the choice of either life will always have its challenges and also its blessings. So, like I said at the beginning, a lot of questions surrounding marriage and divorce, remarriage. I wanted to just focus on what Paul was saying in 1 Corinthians 7. He deals with some specific cases here that were troubling the Corinthian church. In the end, God calls on us to live faithfully with our partners until death. He gives instructions for when there are problems but this is always, always an exception. We are shooting for the ideal. And one thing I always try to remind people, you know, there are times when divorce is justified, and you know, abandonment here, we see this in 1 Corinthians 7, or unfaithfulness of a spouse, you know, we see that. But there's never a divorce, I've never seen one, where there's no sin, no pain, no sorrow, no guilt, you know, it always hurts. I always tell people it always hurts. Sooner or later, it's very, very painful. And even if you're the victim, it's painful. Even if you've, in your own mind, you've done nothing wrong, it's still painful. A lot of people think, you know, divorce, it's the solution. You know, just chop it off. You know, and they don't realize the, the damage that they're doing and the hurt they're going to cause themselves. OK, so that's basically what I believe Paul is teaching us in 1 Corinthians 7 about this particular subject. We've had a lot of talk about marriage and fornication and marriage and divorce, but he's talked about that in the last couple of chapters. We're going to move on now next week. Uh, more material in 1 Corinthians 7, so I encourage you to keep reading that book. And that's our class for this morning. Thank you for your, thank you for your attention. <laughs>